Dear students, welcome to the last lecture on microbial ecosystems. In this particular lecture, we will wrap up around about the aquatic uh, environmental microbiology, the kinds of microbes that live in aquatic systems and we will focus more on oceans, especially when the pressure and temperature get high and then we will move on to our nutrient cycles through the earth as a in, uh, collective ecosystem and we will finish today by um, the human impacts on these nutrient cycles and on the ecosystem in general. All right, let us begin. So, so we will start with ocean microbiology and what this is showing you is how the prokaryotic abundance which is the abundance of prokaryotic microorganisms changes with depth. Now the ones shaded in diagonal are bacteria, the one in the grey um, in the middle are crena archaeota the kind of archaea and the one that are sparsely shaded with dots are ur archaeota another kind of archaea. So we are noticing how that the bacteria and archaeal abundance changes as we go below the earth's uh, below the ocean. Note that the technology used for this getting this data is called card fish which is a fluorescence in fluorescent imaging of microorganisms and we will talk about these microbi microbiological techniques later. So this study was done in North Atlantic in 2005 so it has been quite some time and what we are noticing is that uh, as the oxygen dips so here is the surface and we have some good amount of dissolved oxygen present, maybe even some light and perhaps more nutrients and in this case we notice that there is a very high abundance of bacterial cell, considerable amount of archaeal cell also. In fact, we know that archaeal cell are more than bacterial cell. It is important to note that oceans in general are oligotrophic environment, they are always lacking in some or other nutrient. As the oxygen drops, we the abundance drops and with depth the abundance keeps continues to drop. Now here we have uh, another ocean, we have Antarctica. So in Antarctica you notice that it is different from the Atla North Atlantic. Here we had more archaeal population than bacterial but in Antarctica we have a pre considerably high bacterial population compared to Crana archaeota and Ura archaeota. So as the depth increases from 200 meter to 3000 meter we notice that the bacterial population first dips and then increases again at high, uh, high pressure under high depth and the archaeal population remains considerably constant it increases in fact between 500 and 2000 meters. So, at the, um, at the very surface we have less amount of archaea more eukarya but with depth archaea also gain some abundance. So, basically what we are noticing here is that with depth and with the kind of ocean whether we are talking about North Atlantic Ocean or we are talking about the Antarctic circumpolar current which is Antarctic uh, which is in Antar near Antarctica the microbial population would vary from one kingdom, one domain to another. Not only that, what we notice is that any given depth, this is metagenomic analysis by the way, at any given depth, the diversity in archaea in bacteria and eukaryote also vary. So at the same depth, we notice that archaea at uh, um, in, in, uh, in phylum level, they have less diversity compared to bacteria and compared to eukaryotes which have highest diversity even just visually we can tell that. Now note that this is on in phylum level so in class level that is when we go deeper and we go finer in our resolution we might see different, uh, different scenario in terms of diversity or richness. Another thing to note is that bacteria and eukaryotes tend to be relatively better characterized than archaea. So, we do not know how many archaea are there that have not been sequenced and thus our databases are not populated enough to tell us what the diversity is. But even if we look at on uh, we look at on OTU basis operational taxonomic unit basis we notice that there is high diversity of bacteria and eukaryotes. So, not only the number of bacteria eukaryote and archaea would vary with depth and with oceans but also their diversity. Now, what happens when we go deep in the ocean? So, on x axis you have pressure and on y axis you have the growth rate. So, as we go below in the ocean we increase the pressure increases because the weight of the water above the uh, above the level would be would increase with depth and as that increases we have to have bacteria or microorganisms or organisms in general that can tolerate the high pressure and maybe even thrive in it. 
So, on the right plate on the right panel here on x axis you have temperature on y axis you have pressure. In this we are including another factor of temperature. Many a times the temperature on the ocean surface is, um, is in more agreement with the ambient air temperature, but when we go down we might have uh, undersea thermal vents or maybe undersea volcanic uh, vents where we have because of that we have very high temperatures. So, let us look at the left plate first. So, left plate the y axis is the growth rate doublings per day. So, this is basically the amount of um, this is the rate at which the microbial population will double. So, we notice when pressure goes from 0 to 200 atmosphere that is a lot of pressure we would not survive this. There are microbes that will tolerate this high pressure. So, the microbes that do not whose uh, the microbial community whose growth rate does not drop a lot in fact increases here somewhere in the 100 atmosphere these are piezo tolerant microbes. So, piezo tolerant microbes are the ones that will survive high pressure, but once we increase the pressure beyond 300 atmosphere their growth rate drops very fast they cannot grow the pressure is too much now. So, we note here that the microbes have quite broad range of atmospheric pressure that they can tolerate and yet beyond that they would not survive. Note that human being on the other hand cannot tolerate such high variation in pressure from 0 to 200 atmosphere. Now, in the green here you have piezophilic microbes. So, piezophilic microbes love high pressure. So, when the pressure is not very high their growth rate is lower and then as the pressure increases their growth rate increases. So, per day we will have more doublings up to 3 doublings four, nearly 4 doublings and then they peak around 500 atmosphere and then pressure increases further they drop they cannot tolerate it. In red we have extreme piezophiles. So, these are the microbes that love extremely high pressure. So, when the pressure is less than 300 um, atmosphere they would not even survive they are like give me high pressure and when the pressure starts increasing their growth rate starts increasing it peaks around 700 atmosphere and then it drops all the way to 1000 atmosphere. So, we notice that there as we will go down the depth of an ocean we will move from moderately high pressure which is 0 to 200 high pressure from 200 to 600 and then extremely high pressure 600 and beyond atmosphere. And with each of these classification we will have different kinds of microbes that will thrive. Now, on the right panel we have both pressure and temperature. So, as when the temperature is high and pressure is high such as deep sea hydrothermal vent they are deep sea so they are high pressure anyway and um, so we have, but um, the temperature is very high. So, when the temperature is high we have very different kind of microorganisms here versus the microorganisms in cold deep sea as the pressure increases or decreases and Mediterranean and there is not much difference in temperature. Now, let us look at nutrient cycles. So, we have talked so far about metabolism, we have talked about functions of microbes, we have talked about different ecosystems. Now, very important question arises is how do these microbes drive the nutrients uh, in our ecosystem throughout the earth. Now, this is very important question because this question will lead us to understand how essential microbes are, how essential it is to protect environmental health so that the microbes can do the job of transporting nutrients from one end to another in a way that is most suitable for us. So, let us look here on the left panel you have carbon cycle. So, we have plants here and there are root system, the top layer is aerobic, the bottom layer is anaerobic. So, here we have plant respiration and they are assimilating carbon dioxide from atmosphere. Now, as they do it they die, they decay, they create organic carbon litter and peat you know the leaves and then they uh, what this is sequestered carbon. So, carbon has been sequestered from atmosphere into form of biomass plant biomass that translates into organic carbon peat. So, this is very very fertile and in anaerobic zone and we also have root exudes, exudates. So, these are the um, organic material that are released by roots into the soil. Now, together they form the carbon in the soil and here because of different microbial processes like there might be anaerobic microbes that use this organic carbon peat as source of carbon and as electron donor and release carbon dioxide. It is also possible that in highly anaerobic zones, highly reduced zones we do not have oxygen to make carbon dioxide in fact we have methanogenesis and we have we form methane. It is also possible that the carbon dioxide that is made in the uh, less and uh, less reduced zone will then be 
converted into methane by methanogens. Now, this methanogen can directly be released into the atmosphere, directly released into the oceans or it can be taken up by uh, roots which will, um, which will um, use it as a nutrient. Now, this is a problem when methane directly releases into atmosphere or into water, then we have high methane concentration in atmosphere. And methane is one of the worst gases we want in our atmosphere at high concentration because it has extremely high uh, greenhouse gas effect. So, nearly 20 to 25 times higher greenhouse uh, gas effect than carbon dioxide. So, if I, if I increase carbon dioxide by one molarity, one ppm not molarity, one ppm in the atmosphere, its effect would not be as harmful as increasing one, molar, one ppm of methane. Now, in many uh, permafrost areas, so permafrost areas are the areas where we have permanent frost. So, this permanent ice, let us say in Russia, Siberia and uh, towards the North Pole, we have methane that is trapped as ice. So, in the ice here, we have methane trapped and as climate is changing, this methane is being released out in the atmosphere at a very high rate and uh, people, some scientists estimate that in next few years to come, most of the permafrost methane, the methane trapped in permafrost would release and that will totally overwhelm our climate and we should expect to see a very severe increase in global temperatures and thus um, we are expecting that things would go really bad very soon in terms of climate. So, here you have a picture of the methane trapped in permafrost being ignited. Now, on the right panel again you have a more clearly delineated version of carbon nutrient cycle. So, we have organic matter, organic matter is respired or can be fermented into carbon dioxide and this uh, carbon dioxide can be used by plants for oxygenic photosynthesis or microbes that undergo oxygenic photosynthesis or chemolithotrophy and they will form organic matter which can be respired by beings like such as our own cells heterotrophs and they will make carbon dioxide. Now, carbon dioxide can also be converted back into organic matter in uh, by methanogens which will make methane or by acetogenesis and anoxygenic photogenesis which will make glucose and acet, uh, acetate. Now, the methane can uh, be uh, con uh, oxidized back to carbon dioxide, so methanotrophy microbes that eat methane uh, or um, in fact um, methane might stay trapped in permafrost as it has stayed for a very long time in Siberia. Now, these are two coupled systems, these nutrient cycles do not ex exist in isolation. When carbon moves in and out of a biomass, in and out of a, a, a system like roots or soil, it, or it interacts with other nutrients. For example, biomass will have nitrogen, will have phosphorus. So, when carbon moves, nitrogen also moves. When carbon is sequestered, nitrogen is also sequestered. So, let us look at the coupled carbon and nitrogen cycles. We have atmospheric carbon dioxide, oxygenic photosynthesis will convert it into biomass, litter fall, mortality, degradation, will decomposition will increase org organic carbon uh, matter in soil and they will be respired by microbes and release they will, which will release carbon dioxide or make methane which will release up here as methane. At the same time when this litter um, falls to the earth it also in the red is here by the way nitrogen. So, the nitrogen uh, levels in the soil also increase this might uh, increase contribute to the organic matter in the soil which might get mineralized by microbes as they are respiring the organic matter and thus release soil ni nitrogen which can get denitrified, which can leach into groundwater, or which can again be assimilated by trees and plants or other microbes. So, we know they are nitrogen fixing bacteria, we know that plants need nitrogen rich soil so that they can use it to make biomass. So, this is assimilative process. On the other hand, we also have nitrogen deposition. So, the air is very rich in nitrogen, nearly 70 percent of air atmosphere is made of nitrogen. So, nitrogen can get directly deposited here. Now, on the right panel, we have another kind of degradation. So, since we are talking about biomass, one of the most complex, not complex, one of the most abundant polymers on earth's surface is cellulose. So, cellulose is found everywhere and thanks to trees, we have plenty of it on the earth. Now, this cellulose is a very stable um, form of carbon, carbon based polymer and this is very important because um, the more cellulose we have on earth, the more carbon dioxide we have trapped as cellulose. 
because if cellulose degrades it will form carbon dioxide if we burn trees it directly goes to carbon dioxide and thus we lose the sequestered carbon and we lose it to atmosphere which makes greenhouse ga gas effect worse so let's look at the cellulose degradation we have complex polymers such as cellulose other polysaccharides proteins maybe lignin which is very slow to degrade and then we have cellular cellulolytic and hydrolytic bacteria so these bacteria are uh, they create a secret enzyme in fact they are not usually single bacteria but they are a suite of hundreds of bacteria that make different proteins which together attack cellulose result in cellulose lysis that's why they are called cellulolytic or hydrolysis so they are called hydrolytic and they make monomers of these complex polymers so we'll have cellulobios we'll have glucose now these sugars or amino acids in case of proteins are either fermented by uh, bacteria into hydrogen carbon dioxide which can undergo acetogenesis make acetate and then can be used up by methanogens or they are directly converted into acetate which can undergo methanogenesis or they are fermented into prop propionate, butyrate, succinate, alcohol etc which can make um, H2 plus CO2 which can under go methanogenesis with acetate and in the end we will have methane and carbon dioxide. So here you notice that we are looking at anaerobic, de this part is mostly anaerobic degradation. Now let us go to nitrogen cycle, in nitrogen cycle the key processes are nitrification, denitrification, nitrogen fixation, ammonification and anamox. We have gone over this before in previous lectures, so I will be very brief here. Nitrification is when uh, we are going to higher oxidized states of nitrogen. So from ammonia to nitrate, ammonia to nitrite, nitrite to nitrate done by microbes such as nitrosomonas, nitrobacter. Denitrification is when we are reducing the nitrogen, so going from nitrate to nitrogen gas, right. So pseudomonas, paracoccus, bacillus, they do a good job at it. Nitrogen fixation is when we are fixing the nitrogen in the atmosphere and converting it into a form that can be assimilated by microbes so or by plants. So we have nitrogen with 8 hydrogen forming ammonia and hydrogen gas. They can be aerobic, they can be anaerobic and here is a list of microbes. The symbiotic nitrogen fixers are in symbiosis with plants, the roots of plants. So rhizobium, brady rhizobium and franchia. Ammonification is when organic nitrogen converts into ammonia. Many organisms can do this. It is a very important part of uh, um, multiple treatment plants also. And anamox is a recently discovered phenomena and we have talked about it before where nitrite reacts with ammonia to directly form nitrogen gas. And this is your uh, representation of nitrogen cycle. Okay, now let us look at sulfur cycle. We have gone through sulfur cycle before also, so I will be very quick again. So, um, in sulf sulfur cycle, the prominent or the dominant activities are oxidation of sulfur, so which would be converting sulfide to sulfur or elemental sulfur to sulfate. This can be done both aerobically and anaerobically. Anaerobically, we have talked about it, purple and green phototrophic bacteria do it, some chemolithotrophs can do it, Sul sulfur chemolithotrophs can do it aerobically too. The next is in the reverse direction, so we have sulfate going to sulf elemental sulfur or going to hydrogen sulfide. So, uh, delta proteobacteria, desulfovibrio, desulfobacter, they can do this really well. And then we have, um, okay, so sulfate to hydrogen sulfide and sulfur to hydrogen sulfide. Many hyperthermophilic archaea can do this too. Um, then we have sulfur disproportionation. So we have S2O3 2 minus and then this can convert into, this can disproportionately split into sulfate and hydrogen sulfide. So one of one sulfur gets reduced, the other sulfur gets oxidized, desulfur vibrio and other microbes can do it. Then we have organic sulfur compound oxidation or reduction. So sulfur is not existing as an ion, but it is part of an organic compound and then it is either reduced or oxidized. Many organisms can do it and then we have desulfuration when uh, there is sulfur present within organic material, it is an inherent component of it and then it is reduced to H2S. Okay, now let us look at iron cycle and manganese cycle. Usually iron and manganese cycle are coupled in environment, but let us look at iron first. So this is the first time we are looking at iron, so we will spend some time here. The ferric which is highly oxidized form of iron can be reduced by bacteria or by chemicals or by, you know the chemistry of the ecosystem into ferrous. The ferrous can be further reduced into uh, Fe just elemental iron which very quickly undergoes oxidation. The only way the ferrous will turn into reduced form of our elemental iron is by smelting it 
and uh, ferric also converts into elemental iron by smelting. So smelting is a metallurgical process when you are trying to improve the purity of your iron ore and they are very quick to oxidize. So ferrous uh, elemental iron very quickly convert into ferrous. The ferrous can go very quick undergo uh, quick bacterial or chemical oxidation which is rusting process and make ferric. Now ferric in presence of water will make iron, ferric hydroxide which is soluble in water and it gives water a brown reddish brown color. So let us see how iron and manganese cycles are coupled together. So um, this happens a lot in the water systems, aquatic systems and this is one of the reasons why we have mang high manganese concentration in some parts of the world like Latin America. So um, here we have iron in, form, in ferric form, um, highly oxidized form. Okay, and then goes to the soil, gets reduced by ferro iron reducers, and it escapes out into the water, gets oxidized back into ferric. Cool, right? Cool so far. Or it can f react with carbon dioxide, carbonates, and form iron carbonate. Manganese, here we have manganese in highly oxidized form, we have manganese reducers. Some pseudomonas microbes can do it, and other microbes be that we are still profiling them in um, environmental microbiology. So, there are many microbes that can do this job. Now, this can diffuse into the uh, water and then get oxidized. Now, oxidized version of manganese is um, not soluble in water, so it precipitates into. Um, soil which again can be reduced by manganese reducers. So what we have here is microbial activity is driving dissolution of manganese and because it is driving dissolution of manganese we can have a manganese problem. Okay, now let us look at one of the most tricky uh, metal in cycle in on our earth which is mercury. We are very concerned about mercury because mercury in certain forms is highly toxic. For example, methyl mercury which is when a methyl radical attaches to mercury, not only is it many many more times toxic than mercury in itself, but it is also very easy for it to permeate the skin barrier. So if micro droplet falls on the skin, it will be absorbed very quickly, the mercury will go and attach to your nervous system and affect it very uh, severely. So we have, um, let us start from the top. We have air, water and sediment. So in the air, let us say we have mercury exhaust and mercury is being released by industries or initially as it used to be released by automobiles. So this mercury is uh, in this oxidation state, it is uptaken by cellular membranes. It might convert into methyl mercury which is very, very toxic, enters food chain, yeah, it undergoes bio accumulation, biomagnification and uh, it might actually not only stay as CH3HG but more radicals might join to it and uh, microbes they can, uh, they can convert, some microbes can convert it back to HG2 which will form mercury chloride and again enter cellular membranes or it can form mercury sulphide and um, again to microbial activity we can have elemental uh, mercury which will form uh, HGDOM. And some of this mercury can get deposited into the sediments, it can be sorbed or after methylation it can be or after demethylation when it is removal of methyl radical it can get sorbed into the sediments. So from in the sediment water interface we have efflux, resuspension and redox reaction and here we have deposition and evasion reaction between air and water. So some mercury uh, forms will evade, it will they will go into the air form, some uh, aerosolized mercury will come and dissolve in water. Remember methyl mercury is about 100 times more toxic than just mercury. Now this is really neat, there are some microbes that are resistant to mercury. Mer in, in fact, I remember when I was doing my doctoral research and I wanted to kill the bacteria I was working with and the reason I wanted to kill them was I wanted an abiotic control. So the poison of choice was mercury chloride. So add mercury chloride and microbes will die. What we noticed in many experiments is that there are microbes that do not die when they are present in with, uh, with mercury chloride. So now let us look at a more toxic form of mercury which is methyl mercury. Interestingly there are microbes that are resistant to methyl mercury also. So the way they develop resistant to 100 times more toxic methyl mercury is they use this uh, wonderful enzyme organomercury lyase which converts methyl mercury into methane and mercury. They can in fact then use methane as food source or not and this uh, these enzymes are uh, encoded by MER genes. So if you want to find out the mercury or methyl mercury uh, resistance of microbes, look for MER genes and this is a class of genes by the way, so there are different kinds of MER genes. Okay. 
So this is how I want to end the microbial ecosystem class by talking about, okay, you know about different ecosystems, how microbes like to live there, what are the different environmental parameters that affect them. You also know about the carbon, nitrogen, sulfur and heavy metal cycles in our ecosystem. Now the thing is, how have human activities impacted the cycles and the ecosystem? This is very, very important question because perhaps for the first time in the history of Earth, this um, recent phenomena called humankind or any recent phenomena has so severely impacted and so severely driven the Earth's ecosystem to a, and to a mass extinction phase. So I have said this before in this class and I want to repeat that right now we are under sixth mass extinction stage. So the species and the life as we know it is disappearing from Earth right now at an unprecedented rate to such an extent, at s with such a high speed that we call it extinction phase. And this is worse than any of the other extinction phases ever. And most scientists, in fact all scientists I would say, agree on this that human activities are culprit. So let's try to understand what human impacts have done to carbon nitrogen cycle. Most of you perhaps are already familiar with climate change, are familiar with greenhouse gas effect. So the more we take, so think of it this way, the petrol is a very stable form of carbon. It stays under high pressure deep below the earth's surface for millions of years where it can stay. So that is the carbon that we have trapped in under the earth's surface, it's sequestered carbon. It has, it is not there in atmosphere. And we burn it, we release it in atmosphere. So now we have greenhouse gas effect. So as the carbon uh, emissions have increased, our global temperatures have also increased. So on the right top panel you have how with years the parts per million of global monthly mean on y axis how they have changed. So in 2004 we were hovering between 380 and 370 and then by the time it was 2007 we were already talking about 385 and 380. And now uh, in some places we have exceeded 400. So uh, it's really sad because we are already past the tipping point now. So 350 was the number that was given, do not exceed 350 if you want to save the earth. We already passed it very long, this is a decade old data, we are way past it. And because we are way past it, we know that our climate is changing. We know that our food cycles would change our weather patterns would change, our agriculture would suffer, right? Our storm cycles would change and thus the, the risk of damage we pose to environment, to public health and to health of other species, whether it is animal, microbial, is immense and unprecedented. So on the bottom left panel here we have decades on the x-axis and on the y-axis we have annual temperature. So if we take uh, nearly 1970s and 1960s as the average and we notice how temperatures have steadily increased over last six decades and they keep increasing, they continue increasing. In fact, this rate of increase has never been seen on earth before. Usually there are annual variations but they are much smaller than what we are seeing here. So I want to end this presentation by showing you a slide view. This is from NASA's website of how global temperatures have changed over years. So 1885, 1894, so the blue, the more blue, the colder it is, the gray we don't have information about and the red is warm. So we have very cold, we have some warm here, so this is temperate zone. A decade later, the coolness, look here, all the blue is gone, we have more red. The even here um, even the African continent is getting really red, China is getting very red here. Look at India is relatively cool. So our ancestors, pre-independence an ancestors, pre-World War ancestors did not suffer the heat that we do in India now. Welcome 1965-1974, the whole world is much warmer. Even in south part of India is getting warmer. So our grandparents must be able to tell us that, well, South India used to be hot, North India used to still be cool. But in 1985, 1994, now the entire world is, has heated up really fast. Very few blue portions left. India is now a red zone. India is a hot country now. Uh, and you might notice that Russia and North America seem warmer than India. But please note that these are increase. So they used to be very cold, now they are less cold. So in Siberia, for example, they had permafrost, but now permafrost is releasing, 
right. So, this is not warmer than India, but the rate of change of temperature is higher here than there. This is 1995 and 2004 and this is what I will leave you with uh, as we end this class. So, to recap, we started here um, nearly a century ago and in last 100 years, this is where we have reached. So, dear students, I really hope you understand that in climate change is a very important and very real phenomena. We humans are responsible for it. We are in middle of six mass extinction phase, not surprisingly. It is our duty for uh, to reduce the impact of climate change, to reduce the climate change in uh, at the very first. And one of the ways to handle climate change is to understand how na the nutrient cycles move in our earth. Because carbon, climate change is because of higher carbon in air. So, it is the new carbon cycle that has been affected. So, we know there are human uh, em uh, emissions, anthropogenic emissions, but we also have to understand the microbial processes, how they have changed with this increased release of carbon in atmosphere how they are wrecking, uh, what these changes are going to mean for us and how we can undo them. So, it is very important to understand the microbial processes that govern the nutrients and thus uh, this course is really important and I really hope that with coming in coming near future, people will appreciate the microbial processes and their role in climate and other global problems. So, that is all for today. Thank you so much. Music